And it's amazing to see all you people out here this early this morning. Thank you so much for being here. So most of the talks today are really going to be about the mechanics of how we build great products and services. But for the starting talk, my talk, I want to talk about something a little bit different. I want to talk about the dynamics of how we do our best work as people who work in product design. How do we make sure that we don't get constantly distracted? Right? How many of you felt distracted at work in the last 24 hours by a colleague, by a ping, by a ding, by some kind of technology? Almost every hand in the room, right? We all constantly feel this pull of constant distraction, right? You sit down at your desk and you say, oh, I'm definitely going to work on that big project right now. I'm going to focus and crank it out right after I check my email, right after I check that Slack channel, right after I do this one quick thing on my phone, and we can't do our best work. So is it really our technology, these pings and dings that are at fault for all of these distractions? Or is there something deeper going on? So let's explore that for a bit. You know, part of the reason that so many of our tech products are so engaging these days is because of this, the Hook model. How many of you, by the way, have, have had a chance to read Hooked, my first book? Oh. I love you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. The book came out five years ago, and the idea behind the book was to help all sorts of people, not just the gaming companies and the social media networks create engaging habit-forming products, but so that all of us can use these types of products for good. And here's how the hooked model works. Real quick, I'll give you a very quick overview. The idea is that every engaging habit-forming product takes users through these four steps, from a trigger some kind of notification on your phone, to an action, the simplest behavior done in, in anticipation of a reward, to the reward phase. This is where there's some kind of intermittent reinforcement, some kind of mystery, some kind of uncertainty around what you might find when you use the product. And finally, into the investment phase, where the user puts something into the product to make it better and better with use. And through successive cycles through these hooks, this is how customer habits are formed, how our tastes are shaped, and how these, these long-term routines take hold. So the reason I wrote this book, as I mentioned earlier, is because I wanted companies of all kinds, you know, YouTube and Facebook and the gaming companies, they've known these tactics for years. I did not write Hooked for them. I wrote it for you. I wrote it for the kind of people who are making products and services that would truly improve and enhance people's lives if they only used the darn product. And that's exactly what's happened in the past five years. Companies like Kahoot, the world's largest educational software. Pantry Labs makes these, these uh, uh, vending machine replacement devices that bring farm fresh food to people's offices and food deserts. Uh, Pan, uh, Paga is, is, has brought millions of previously unbanked people online in sub-Saharan Africa for the first time. All of these products use the hook model for good. But of course, there's a downside. And we've all seen how products that are built to be so engaging can somehow distract us. And so there's another reason why I decided to explore this area of consumer psychology, and that was that a few years ago, I found that I was using these products in a way that I didn't always like. And I remember I was sitting with my daughter uh, shortly after Hooked was published, and we had this book of activities that daddies and daughters could play together. And one of the activities in the book was to ask each other this question. If you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I, rem I remember the question verbatim, but I don't remember what my daughter said. Because as she was telling me what superpower she would want, I was busy doing something on my phone. And I wasn't paying attention. And she quickly learned that whatever was on my phone was more important than she was. And she left the room and started to play with some toy outside. It's hard for me to even tell this to you now, years later, but if I'm honest with you, that didn't just happen once. It happened time and again. Not just with my daughter, when I was with my friends, when I was at work and I would say I'm gonna do some important task and yet I'd still get off track. This kept happening time and time again. And that's when I realized, if you asked me what superpower I would want, I would tell you that I would want the power to be indistractable. This is the power, the most important skill of this century. The power to do what we say we are going to do, not just in business, but in all aspects of our life. 
So one thing that we, can, uh, we, we should take some comfort in knowing is that distraction is not a new problem. Do we really think if Zuckerberg said, you know what, I've had enough of this whole Facebook thing, I'm going home, I'm taking my money, and I'm going to turn off Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, do we really think people will stop getting distracted? Of course not. People have been distracted throughout history. In fact, Socrates and Plato talked about this 2,500 years ago. They called it akrasia, the tendency that we all have to do things against our better interests. And they asked themselves, you know, why do we do this? If we know what to do, we all know that if we want to exercise, we got to go to the gym. We know how to basically eat right. We know that if we want to do our best work, we have to focus and actually do the hard work. Why don't we do it? Even 2,500 years ago, people were saying how distracting the world is. So how can we start to unpack the deeper psychology around why we sometimes do things against our better interest? So here's one way to look at the problem. We can ask ourselves, to understand distraction, we need to ask ourselves, what is the opposite of distraction? Many people will tell you the opposite of distraction is focus. It's not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. You see, both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And you'll notice both end in the same six-letter word, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do in life, things that you do with intent. The opposite of traction is distraction, any action that pulls you away from what you plan to do with intent. Now, many people will tell you that they got distracted when, oh, their phone buzzed, or this happened, or this thing, and that led to distraction, right? That was the source of the distraction. But what they're doing is conflating what's called the external trigger, the ping, the ding, the ring, something that prompts you to either traction or distraction with the action itself. And as bad as we think these external triggers are, the root cause of distraction overwhelmingly is not the external triggers, but it is in fact the internal triggers. Internal triggers are these uncomfortable emotional sensations that we seek to escape from. And so if we are to tackle this problem of distraction, we have to start at the source of the problem. The source of the problem, the real reason that we do things against our better interests, things that we know we don't really want to do, is for one reason and one reason only. And that is to escape some kind of uncomfortable sensation. This is called the homeostatic response. And believe it or not, it's why we do everything. If we want to understand distraction, we have to understand motivation. Why do we do what we do? If you ask most people, they'll tell you that motivation is about carrots and sticks, right? It's about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. But that's not true. That in fact, neurologically speaking, it's all pain. Everything we do is about a desire to escape discomfort. You know this to be physiologically true, right? If you go outside and it's cold, that doesn't feel good, you put on a coat. If it's hot, you take it off. If you are hungry, that doesn't feel good, so you eat. And when you're stuffed, oh, that doesn't feel good, you stop eating. So that's physiological responses. The same can be said of our psychological responses, right? Where do we go? What app or website do we check when we're feeling lonely? Where do we go? Facebook, right? Somebody said Tinder. Oh. <laughs> Also true, different kind of loneliness. Where do we go when, we, when we're feeling uncertain about something? Before we scan our brains to see if we know the answer, what are we doing? We Google it, of course. And where do we go when we're feeling bored? What, what, what kind of, where do we go when we're feeling bored? Instagram. Instagram, we check the news, we look at stock prices, ESPN, Pinterest, all of these products and services fundamentally cater to this uncomfortable internal trigger. So if we know that all behavior is prompted by a desire to escape discomfort, that means that time management is pain management. And so we have to fundamentally understand that we, if we are to do what we say we are going to do, we have to either fix the source of the problem, figure out what it is that is causing us this discomfort, or learn tactics to cope with it. So today happens to be the uh, launch of my book. Today is the publication date of Indistractable. So thank you, I appreciate it, thank you. And so I don't have time, unfortunately I only have about 25 minutes, so I don't have time to go through everything in the book, but I just wanna share with you a few quick tips that you can use starting today to start becoming indistractable. First, by realizing that time management is pain management. Sorry, the 
font didn't transfer over there perfectly, but time management is pain management. That's what that's supposed to say. And so here's a few quick wins that you can use starting today to start managing these uncomfortable internal triggers that prompt you to either traction or distraction. There's nothing wrong, by the way, with feeling uncomfortable. One of my big beefs with the personal development self-help industry is that we're constantly told, you're supposed to be happy all the time. You're supposed to be satisfied. That is evolutionarily not true. It's bullshit. In fact, our species is designed evolutionarily to constantly want more. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That prompts us to do our best work, to do more, to strive to succeed, to progress. However, if we let those sensations get the best of us, they can lead us to distraction as opposed to traction. So how do we start managing these uncomfortable internal triggers so that they don't take us off track? Here's the first thing we do. We simply note the sensation. By noting the sensation, and I mean putting it down on a, a piece of paper. So here's what happens to me. Almost every day, I sit down, I'm gonna work on that big project, and I'm tempted to just go check email for a quick minute, right? Let me just go check that worky thing. I call this pseudo work. It feels like it's work. It feels like I'm being productive. But if it's not what I plan to do, it is just as much of a distraction. So instead of giving into that distraction, I'll simply note that sensation. OK, this is hard. I'm feeling stressed. This is boring. Whatever it might be, noting the sensations, psychologists tell us, is the first step to gaining control over them. The next thing that we want to do is to get curious instead of contemptuous. Many of us, as I used to do, whenever we would feel these uncomfortable states and we'd get distracted, we beat ourselves up. We say, oh, you see, I, I have a short attention span, or I'm lazy, or I have an addictive personality. We start beating ourselves up with contempt as opposed to getting curious. And when we become curious, by simply s sensing that feeling, acknowledging it, and becoming aware of it with curiosity, this is how we gain control over it. And then what we want to do is to start surfing the urge. This is a technique that comes out of acceptance and commitment therapy, and all we have to do when we feel that sensation is to realize that most of these sensations, they crest and subside. So I use what's called the 10-minute rule. The 10-minute rule says that you can give in to any temptation, whether it's the chocolate cake or checking your Slack channel when you shouldn't or checking email when you want to focus. You can do anything you want in 10 minutes. And many times I'll take out my phone and say, set a timer for 10 minutes. And my job is to either be with that sensation, get curious about that sensation, or get back to the task at hand. And it feels like it's going to take forever, but actually what you find is with just a few minutes of surfing that urge, you will get back nine times out of 10 to the task at hand. And if you really, really want to do the thing, give in to that temptation in 10 minutes, go for it. But you'll find 90% of the time you'll get right back to work. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, but let's move on to the next step that we can take. How do we make time for traction? So it turns out, that the only way we can tell the difference between traction and distraction is one word. And that one word is intent. Because you know that distraction tricks you, right? You think you're supposed to be doing, oh, I'll just check that one email, or I'll just go on that quick Slack channel, and that feels worky, it feels productive, but that is not what you plan to do. And so that means in this day and age, we have to plan our day. Because here's the thing. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So when I was writing this book, I had this good friend who told me about, oh, you're that guy who wrote Hooked, and look, now I can't get anything done. I'm constantly distracted with these things on my device, and my boss wants this, and my kids want that, and did you see what Donald Trump just tweeted? And she, I can't get anything done, she told me. And I said, wow, that's, that's terrible. I'm really sorry about that. Can I see what it was you planned to do today? Can I see your calendar? And she kind of took it out, and she opened her calendar, and she showed it to me, and it was blank. There was nothing on it. Maybe a dentist appointment or a work meeting. So here's the thing. We can't call something a distraction unless we know what it distracts us from, which means we have to start keeping time box calendars. It turns out that two-thirds of Americans don't keep any sort of calendar whatsoever. And the third of us who do, most of us don't do it properly. And so what I propose, and this is a technique that has been studied for decades. This is called setting an implementation intention. Just a fancy way of saying planning out what you will do and when you are going to do it. Many people look at this as I did the first time I saw this. Ooh, that doesn't look good. This is so rigid. It's so formal. I need time to, to be creative and to be spontaneous. Yes, you can plan for that time. And 
This is the price of living in the 21st century, folks. We don't have to chop our own wood. We don't have to kill our own food. We have to make a calendar. OK? It's not too much to ask. And what we want to do is to make sure that we can turn our values into time. I should be able to know what you value in life just by looking at your calendar. Do you value your physical health? Do you have time in your calendar? Do you value relationships like your friends, your family, your kids? Let me see in the calendar. Do you value time to focus without distraction at work? It needs to be in the calendar because if you don't plan your day, someone else will. If there is white space in your calendar, you know what we'll do with it. We'll do this. We'll get distracted with these screens we all always carry around with us. So the only way to know the difference between traction and distraction is to have it on your calendar. Whatever is on that calendar is traction. Whatever is not is distraction. So we want to make time for traction in our life. And the first thing we have to do is to plan the input, the time, not the output. So many of us, myself included, we buy into this myth of the to-do list, right? That's what the productivity gurus tell us. If you just put things on a to-do list, they'll magically get done. But that's ridiculous because that's just the output. What we have to plan for is the input of time. That is what we as knowledge workers do. Our input is the time we put in to a task. And then what we need to do is called schedule syncing, where we sit down with our boss, with our colleagues, with our team, and we say, hey, look, here's everything I have time to do this week. You can see where it is in my calendar. These other tasks that you lobbed over, that you said, hey, can you get those done? There's no time for those. So which one should I reprioritize? This simple practice takes 15 minutes a week for most people, and it will revolutionize your work life. The next thing we want to do is to get rid of low value tasks. The Harvard Business Review found that one day out of every five day work week for the average knowledge worker is spent doing what's called low value work. Work that you didn't have to do or could have been uh, given off to someone else to do. The solution of get, to get, getting rid of this low value work is to use all the amazing technologies we have to let the, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning, do some of these tasks. For example, one product that I use, I don't have any affiliation with the company, I just think it's fantastic, is called x.ai. x.ai is this artificial intelligence that books meetings for you, so you don't have to go through this email ping pong game every time you want to schedule a coffee with someone. The next thing we want to do is to spend less time communicating and more time concentrating. The average knowledge worker has only about an hour and a half every day to do anything that is not meetings and email. Can you believe that? That is where we do all our work, is that one hour per day. But if we're really honest with ourselves, you know where you do your best work. You do it after work. right? You do it at home. You do it on nights, weekends. But of course, who pays the price for that? Our families, our friends, our health. And so the idea here is that we want to schedule time in our day for that concentration and not give in to all of this constant communication. Time for reflection as opposed to simply reacting. Now, part of the reason that all that communicating is so distracting is because it comes coupled with these external triggers, right? You receive all these pings, dings, rings every time you get a Slack channel notification or an email, et cetera, and those can be very distracting. Now, there is one profession where distraction is literally a matter of life and death. If I were to ask you, what is the third leading cause of death in the United States of America? I'll give you the first two. Number one is heart disease. Number two is cancer. What's number three? What do you think? Car accidents, uh, stroke, Alzheimer's, right? Not even close. You've seen the presentation before. Stop giving away my punchlines. Thank you. The third leading cause of death in the United States, if it was a disease, would be medication mistakes. People inside hospitals given the wrong medication or the wrong dosage of medication by healthcare practitioners. 200,000 Americans are harmed every single year by this completely preventable human error. Turns out that most hospitals in America believe that this is just a fact of life. There's nothing they can do about it until a group of nurses at UCSF decided to figure out what was the source of this problem. And they discovered the real cause of this problem was nurses being distracted while they were dosing out medication. They were interrupted on average 10 times during each and every one of their dosing medication rounds. So these nurses came up with a terrific solution. The solution wasn't some multi-million dollar program. It wasn't some amazing new technology. You know what the solution was? Plastic vests. 
plastic vest that these nurses could wear to tell their colleagues, drug round in progress, do not disturb. And that was enough to do what's, what I call hack back those external triggers. Tell those external triggers, in this case, your colleagues, not to interrupt you. What's so sad about what happened with these nurses is that they didn't realize the mistakes they were making. Before this program took shape, they thought they were doing a great job. They didn't realize the mistakes they were making until it was too late. And this should ring true for us. We think we're doing our best work, and we don't realize that we're doing pretty good work despite the distractions, and how much better we could be if we worked distraction-free for some hours of the day. So what can we learn from these nurses? How can we take this lesson to heart? Well, what if we did something like this? So in every copy of Indistractable, which is on sale, by the way, at the back of the room, I'll sign them later on, every copy of the book comes with this screen sign that you can pull out of the book. It's made on cardstock. You fold it up and you put it on your computer monitor and tells your colleagues, don't disturb me right now, I'm indistractable. Now I know some of you are thinking, I don't need this because I got the earphones, right? Let me tell you something. People think you're watching YouTube when you put on those headphones. So we need to send a more explicit message. And you don't, if you don't feel like buying the book, that's fine. I'm going to give you a link where you can download this, print this up for yourself, cut it out, and put it and start using it on your computer monitor right away to hack back those external triggers. Now we can also hack back the external triggers on our devices. Our phones come built with these amazing tools that almost no one uses to block out distraction. So when I sit down to work, I use the do not disturb while driving mode. Now I'm not driving, I'm at my desk, but I can send people this auto reply every time they text me, every time I get a phone call, an auto reply shoots out that says I'm indistractable right now. If this is urgent, text me with the word urgent. And if they do so, the message will come through. Okay? So if it's really urgent, I'll get that message. We can also remove all of these external triggers on our desktop. How many of you have desktops that look like this? It's okay, you don't have to admit it. We don't have to live this way, right? All of these external triggers have been shown by cognitive uh, psychologists to be way too distracting for us. So what we can do, we can tuck them all away into one folder called everything and search for those files later. Our phones, same problem. Two-thirds of Americans don't adjust their notification settings, and we're constantly receiving all of these pings and dings. We can adjust our phone settings so that we don't have all of these constant distractions. The idea here is to hack back these external triggers, starting with asking ourselves this critical question. Is the trigger serving me, or am I serving it? If the external trigger is prompting you to do something you want, that's great. If it's your alarm clock that says, oh, it's time to go work out, or it's time for that meeting, wonderful. That external trigger is serving you. The technology is great. But if the external trigger is prompting you to do something you didn't intend to do, like check your phone when you wanted to be with your daughter, now you are serving it. Then what we want to do, of course, is to adjust those notification settings so only the most important notifications get through. And then we want to leave these distracting devices outside of meetings. Now, I know this is going to ruffle some feathers, but I think if we are going to meet in person, in the real world, we need to be present both in body and mind. So I recommend one laptop per meeting just to record notes and project those so that everybody can see that their ideas are captured. But we don't all need these devices in every single meeting because our devices have this secondhand smoke effect. When you see someone checking email, it feels like they're being productive and you're not. And pretty soon everybody's on their devices as opposed to being fully present in the meeting. We need to do this in the workplace and especially when it comes to our social lives with our friends and our family. Finally. The last step to becoming indistractable is to prevent distraction with pacts. Now, word of warning here, this needs to come last. This is what we do after we've mastered the internal triggers, after we've made time for traction, after we've hacked back the external triggers. The last thing we can do is to use what's called a pre-commitment device. The first case of someone using a pre-commitment device comes to us from a story that is over 2,500 years old, the story of Ulysses in the Odyssey, written by Homer, the philosopher. And in the story, Ulysses has to sail his ship past the island of the Sirens. Now, these sirens are these mythical creatures that sing a magical song, and anyone who hears the song of the sirens crashes their ship onto the shore of the Sirens Island and dies. Now, Ulysses, he knows this is going to happen. So he takes steps to make sure he doesn't do something he doesn't want to do, make sure he doesn't get distracted. What does he do? 
He tells his crew to put wax inside their ears so they can't hear the siren song. And he tells them, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, I want you to bind me to the mast of the ship and don't let me go, no matter what I do. And guess what? The plan works. Ulysses successfully sails the ship past the island of the sirens, bringing his crew and ship home safely. So what can we learn from this? How can we adapt this in our own work life? Well, we can use tech to block out tech. So here's two tools that I use almost every day. Self-control on my desktop blocks out the services that I might give into distraction and make sure I can't get to those things. It blocks out things like Gmail and whatever else I'm doing while I want to do focused work. Then we can use an app called Forest. This is a great little service. Here's how it works. Every time you open the Forest app, you see this little virtual tree. And you dial in how much time you want to do focused work for. And if you pick up your phone and do anything with it, the little virtual tree dies. <laughs> okay? I know none of you want to be virtual tree murderers. And so it's amazing. It's just a stupid little virtual tree. Who cares? But it's enough of a reminder. Oh, I made a contract with myself to just do this one task right now. And I use this app all the time. It's fantastic. We can also, one of the techniques that we can use is to find a focused friend. You know, if you think about our parents' generation, when they went to work before the personal computer, they, when they went to work, you know, it was pretty obvious if you were reading ESPN or Vogue at your desk, people would look at you funny and say, why aren't you working? Why are you putzing around? Well, today we can be hunched over our laptop looking at ESPN and nobody would know the difference, right? It looks like we're making sales calls or, or sales leads or something. So the idea here is to find a focused friend so that you can work together for a fixed period of time to get your focused work in. And if you say, well, I work from home or I don't really want to work with anybody from my office, how about this? Focusmate.com. This is a site I love so much. Full disclosure, I invested in the company because I thought it was such a great idea. Do you guys remember Chat Roulette? So it's just like Chat Roulette, <laughs> but without of all the dirty, nasty parts, okay? <laughs> None of that stuff. So here's how Chat Roulette, or no, not Chat Roulette. Here's how Focusmate works. So you, you, this is particularly great for people who have time getting started. So if you're the kind of person who sets time in their calendar, you know, 9 o'clock, I'm going to start that hard project, but 9.15 rolls around 9.30. With Focusmate, what you do instead, you put a time on, your, on this, uh, this platform where you will have someone else meet you at a fixed period of time online. This was a, a medical school student in the Czech Republic. You see them, they see you. You say, hey, good morning, what are you working on? Okay, good, go. And you have, for that entire time period, you'll see a little video box of them working. And it's amazing how just having that commitment packed with another person to do your focused work helps you stay on task. It sounds simple. It's incredibly helpful and productive. So the idea here is to reduce distractions with packs. And, and so the idea here is to use our tech to block out tech distraction. But let me give you one word of warning. That Using these pre-commitment devices, these pacts, can backfire. Okay? This is what we wanted to do last. If you haven't done the other three steps first of ma mastering internal triggers, making time for traction, hacking back the external triggers, this technique will fail. So don't jump into this first. The reason it often fails is because people haven't done those three steps or some people, when they fall off the wagon, when they fail for the first time, they take it really hard. And we should know that we will all get distracted from time to time. Becoming indistractable doesn't mean you never get distracted. It means you strive to do what you say you're going to do. But the people who take this hard and don't get back on track, these are people, psychologists tell us, who don't have self-compassion. Turns out that people who have more self-compassion uh, self are much more likely to reach their long-term goals. So how do we cultivate self-compassion? It's actually quite simple. What we need to do is to talk to ourselves the way we would talk to a good friend. You know, in my case, if, you, if, you, if people heard the conversation I had with myself, how mean I was, how contemptuous I was with myself, you know, if I talked to my friends the way I talked to myself, I wouldn't have any friends. And we do this to ourselves all the time. You know, if, if I asked you, uh, you know, with my daughter, uh, if I told you that story and I was vulnerable and said, hey, I messed up and here's what happened when I was with my daughter and I checked my phone, would you tell me I'm a horrible human being? I'm a bad father? Is that what you would say to me if you were my friend? No, of course not, right? But we talk to ourselves that way all the time. And you know what? It's not helpful and it doesn't work. And here's what else doesn't work. This idea that we are all somehow addicted to technology 
that it's hijacking our brains. That is also not true and it is not helpful because there is so much that we can do. We can master these internal triggers. We can make time for traction. We can hack back the external triggers and we can prevent distraction with these pacts. And so the lesson I wanna leave with you today is that we can do this. You know, recently when I was finishing up my book, I sat down with my daughter and I told her that I was really sorry that I hadn't listened to her when I asked this question the first time, but now I was genuinely curious, what superpower would she want, I asked her. And she told me, honest to goodness, this is what she said, she told me she would want the power to always be kind. That's what she said, I swear to God. I wiped off my tear. <laughs> And then I, I thought about this afterwards. I thought, wow, that's, that's really interesting because we all have the power to be kind, don't we? You know, I expected to hear that she wanted to fly like Superman or have power like the Incredible Hulk, but no, no, she just wanted to always be kind. And we all have that ability. And the same goes for distraction. We all have the power to get the best out of these technologies without letting them get the best of us. We all have the power to become indistractable. Thank you very much. Thank you.